Okay, hi everyone. Um, so first of all, I wanna give a shout out to, um, to Karn Aaron, who is, was on the, on the computer and um, to Tina Barenbaum, of course, for organizing this. So if you guys saw the flyer, once a month, we're gonna be having our San Diego speakers and they're amazing people. Um, so we're starting off with Mrs. Ariella Adato, who we're really excited for. Um, and also, there was another thing. Okay, now I forgot, but I'm going to read her bio because it's really impressive and I'd rather not miss anything. So here it goes. Um, Ariella Adato is a native of Los Angeles and has been teaching tour classes for adults for more than 20 years and high school for the past seven years. She holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard University with a major in Russian studies and a master's in Jewish history from Turo College. She met her husband, Rabbi Adato, who I'm sure we all know, um, during college, and they married in her junior year and lived together in Boston for their Shana Rishona, their first year of marriage. They then moved to Yerushalayim, where Rabbi Adato learned in the mirror, and later Rav Ruvain Luchters, Kolo. And Ariella took her first teaching position at Madrash at Rachel. In 1999, two children, and three years later, they um, moved to Los Angeles to join the Valley Kolo, where they both taught adult Torah classes, and ran religious enrichment programs for the growing community. Then in 2004, when the Valley Colo closed, they moved briefly to Palo Alto, and then in 2005, settled here in San Diego, where Rabbi Adato has been working for, and work, yes, working for Sky High. <laughs> From 2004 to 2015, Ariella enjoyed being a stay-at-home mom with small children while working and volunteering at Sky High as needed. And then in 2013, that's no joke, I'm just <laughs> in 2013 yeah and uh, we spoke about this yesterday once us. That's, that's a that's yeah okay anyways and for another time in 2013 when her youngest started school full-time ariella taught briefly at hebrew day under the guidance and mentorship of mrs betty weiser um who is on our list of speakers coming up and in 2014 she began teaching at torah high which has become a central part of her life ariella and rabbi azado live in the college area and now have thank god seven children and one in-law <laughs> um, so without further ado, um, now that I could, now that we're in person, I can say, please silence your phones. And for those of you on Zoom, please mute yourselves. Um, and we are so excited to welcome Mrs. Ariella Adato. Thank you, Brooke, so much. Do you want water? No, I don't. Okay. So nice to be here. Thank you to the women at Adopt for organizing and for inviting me to come speak. Um, <clears throat> I really have been enjoying teaching at Torah High, um, although as I just told <clears throat> Hilda, the first five years were very hard. Um, and really only the last year and a half have been really enjoyable. Um, and for me, that's important to be able to, to be able to fail and to be able to have things be hard and be okay with it. And <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw the title for the class, but my title is Fail Better. And <clears throat> the title came about because Karin was pressuring me for a title and I'm a very last minute person. And four weeks before class, I had no idea what I was gonna wanna talk about. Um, but I saw this quote and it just struck me. It's by someone named Samuel Beckett. I don't know who he is. Anybody? Oh yeah, he's the name. Oh, psychologist? Author. Author, okay. Ever tried, ever failed? No matter, try again, fail again, fail better. You won't believe what you can accomplish by attempting the impossible with the courage to repeatedly fail better. And it's an important thing for all of us. Um, it's especially important for teens. Um, I attended a workshop uh, for, about educating teens and from a religious educator who said, one of the most important things for our religious teens to know is that failure is okay. Just because you transgress one Avera or you don't fulfill a certain mitzvah, does not mean you should throw out everything. It's okay to fail. It's okay not to be perfect. Um, and I think for us as well, we, you know, we get so down on ourselves when one thing we fail at one thing or we make a mistake or things don't go the way we want them to. Can you hear me in back? 
Um, and like I said, for me, these <clears throat> those years of struggling to teach and feeling like, you know, I wasn't doing well. Thank God I had my kids as my students and they said, Emma, you're good, it's fine. And it's like, no, but it's not as good as it should be. It's not, it doesn't feel good. Um, so it's nice when you have those outside voices telling you, no, you really are doing okay. Um, but that feeling of not living up to your potential and not fulfilling what you want to what you want to accomplish is very very frustrating. Um, but being able to to live with that and and see it as part of your development is really what I want to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> we're learning gray sheet in uh, in my in the high school class this year, not the ninth grade, but the other grades. We're doing gray sheet, and one of the themes that I really emphasize in gray sheet is the things in Bray Sheet that went wrong. When God created the world, um, the Torah tells us multiple things that didn't go as planned, right? We have in the very beginning of creation, Hashem creates this light, this amazing light, not connected to the sun, just light. And then by the end of creation, God says, no, this light isn't really good for the world. We're going to take this light and put it away somewhere else and make a different light for the world, the light from the sun right? Change of plans. Um, but where I, where I really want to start is on day three. Oh, I need to get closer. Yeah. So on day three, when Hashem creates the <coughs> plants, Perak Aleph, Pasuk Yod Aleph, So it's hard. Oh, by the way, my phone broke. So I have 1020. Okay. Uh, I should, I'll just glance over here. But if definitely I'm going to long time. <laughs> <laughs> I probably won't. So. Okay, I'll keep that. <laughs> Yud Aleph, Pasuk Yud Aleph, it's day three. Um, so the Pasuk says, Vayomer Lokim Tad Haaretz Desha. Hashem said, the earth should sprout, sprout forth vegetation. Asev Mazria Zera, her herbage yielding seed. Eight pre osepri, fruit trees that yield fruit, let me know according to their species, asher zar obo, that their seeds are in it on the arts, on the land, and it was so. Then the next passage says, vatotse haaretz, the land brought forth, and it repeats what happened in the previous passage. The land brought forth this vegetation of these plants that have seeds, and then there's a slight change, whereas the first passage told us that Hashem says to bring forth Eight pre osa pre. In English, we would translate eight pre, a fruit tree, osa pre, that produces fruit, which makes sense. But the Torah now changes slightly and says, What did the land bring forth? Eight osa pre, a tree that produces fruit. So not a eight pre osa pre, not a fruit tree that produces fruit but just a tree that produces fruit. So Rashi comments and says, Rashi on eight pre, really the land didn't produce what Hashem wanted. The Hashem wanted, tam ketam hapri. Hashem wanted that the taste of the tree should be the taste of the fruit. You could take a bite out of the trunk of the tree and it would taste the same as the fruit. The hilo came, but the land didn't produce that. Ella, rather, it produced eight osepri, a tree that produces fruit, veloha eight sepri, but that didn't produce that the tree is the fruit. Therefore, Adam al avono. Therefore, when Adam was later punished for his sin, the land also is remembered for its sin and it also gets punished. What's the punishment to the ground? So when Adam gets punished, it says, right, the land is going to bring forth thorns and thistles and all these bad things. So, right, it's a crazy Rashi. <laughs> First of all, how can the land sin? Lands can't sin. Lands don't have free choice. Hashem made the land produce what it produced, right? And what is this about? Oh, well, because Adam sinned, now the land is going to get punished with Adam, right? It's a very crazy Rashi. So 
when we try to understand it, what does it mean? What went wrong to begin with? When it says Hashem wanted the land to produce a tree, a eight pre osa pre, a fruit tree that produces fruit, but instead it produces just a tree that produces fruit. Yeah, we're clear on that, that distinction. So you have to understand what tree and fruit mean. This is based on the Maharal. The Maharal says, when you think of a tree and a fruit, if you, if you think of a fruit tree, right, let's say a peach tree, what's the ultimate goal, highest purpose of the peach tree? To produce peaches, right? So the tree itself, when that tree starts growing, what are you waiting for? You're waiting for the peaches, right? You're like, okay, one year, two years, three years, when are the peaches going to grow? When are they going to not be or uh, green anymore? When are they going to start to be yellow and edible, right? So the tree, the fruit is the, the goal. The fruit is what we're, what the end point is. The tree is, an, is the concept of process. The, you can't produce peaches out of the ground. You need a tree. You need to plant the tree. It needs to grow. It needs to mature. It needs to develop branches and leaves and buds, right? So tree represents process and fruit means end point. When the Torah says that Hashem wanted an eight pre, osa pre, it wanted the tree to be a fruit tree, that the tree itself you could eat. What that means, according to the Maharal, is that the end point and the process would be identical. They would be one and the same. There would be no gap between the process and the goal. That the world would reflect perfectly the ideal that Hashem created it for. But what did the land produce? The land produced something completely different. It didn't produce that the ideal and the process are the same. It produced process and goal, that we have to go through this concept of tree, of process in order to get to the end point. Does that make sense? Oh. <laughs> now, why did that happen? Why did the ground not do what Hashem asked it to do? How could Hashem say, I want the world to, right, let's talk in God terms, right? I want the world to reflect spirituality perfectly. I want, the world is a place for humans to pursue spirituality. I want the fruit and the tree to look the same. I want the world to look like a place that is imbued with spirituality, that people can just come and take a bite out of that tree, take a bite out of the world and you'll eat pure spirituality, right? I'm speaking metaphorically, right? That you could, you could just taste spirituality everywhere in the world. But that didn't happen. When the, when the earth actually produced the tree, it didn't produce that reality. And it's not because it sinned is a word you have to kind of, it's a code word. Sinned means it, it had to do it differently. It didn't do the ideal state because it couldn't do the ideal state. Because in creating physicality, by definition, there is, you are creating a gap between spiritual, a, a space between spirituality and everything else. So the way that the Maharal explains this is as follows. When Hashem created the earth, the earth already has what, who is, where is Adam created from, right? He's taken from the earth. So this earth that is now producing vegetation is also, it contains Adam in the earth. He's already in there in potential because in three more days, Hashem is going to say, bring this earth out and we're going to make man. So this earth that is producing trees already has Adam in there. Now, because Adam is already in that earth, it means that earth has to have the ability to not reflect the ideal perfectly because Adam has to have free will. For Adam to have free will, it means that earth needs to have the ability to not perfectly reflect the ideal. Because if the world perfectly reflects the ideal, if the tree and the fruit are the same taste, then it means that Hashem is so clear in the world. If the goal of the world is so evident when we look around, when we live our lives, there's no room for free will. Spirituality is the, is the obviousness of the world. 
So that doesn't leave any room for free will. So because the land has to ultimately produce Adam, who has to have free choice, it means that earth by definition has within it the necessity that goal and process are not the same, that the world doesn't reflect the ideal. You cannot look at the world and see God clearly because that would take away the ability to have free choice. And so when the ground is first producing vegetation, you see that the ground itself, when the earth is when the earth starts functioning, it, it by definition has to not reflect reality completely, spiritual reality completely. Because that gap between process and endpoint, between ideal and actual, has to not be perfectly reflected to enable man to have free choice. So this is uh, uh, one of the questions I asked my students in the beginning of school. I have them feel like a little personal about them worksheet. And one of the questions I asked is, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Um, I'm a very proud pessimist. <laughs> my husband calls me a happy pessimist, but I really love finding the flaws. <laughs> I love, it. part of it is good. Like, you, you know, like it's part of the fixer person in me. Of like, let's look around and see what needs to be fixed, right? What needs to be improved. But here also, it's so beautifully pessimistic. The world has to be flawed. The world can't be perfect. We would have no job if the world were perfect. If the world perfectly reflected God and spirituality, what would we accomplish? What, what would our free choice be? What would, we, what, would be, what, would be, what would we be here to do? And the whole world, right? God's creating this world for us. He's creating the world for a place where we have free choice. So when, he, when the physical creation comes into being, it can't perfectly reflect God. It's not that it sinned, it didn't go against God's will. It's just God's will in reality looks like this. Ideally, God's will is that everything reflects spirituality perfectly, but his will in the world is that it not reflect perfectly. And so when the land actually put God's will into actuality, it had to not do it perfectly because that really is God's will in the world. So it's not quite a sin. It's just when you translate it into physical terms, this is what it has to look like to enable man to function here. Okay. The next failure in creation. You've heard this medrash before, right? Every just pass it, right? You heard that the moon complained. Okay. The moon complained. We can't both be same size. So, so I'm going to read you the passage, okay? Parak Aleph, Pasuk Tetzan. Vayas Elohim et Shnei HaMe'orot HaGedolim. Hashem created or made the two big luminaries, HaMe'orot HaGedolim, the two great luminaries. Et HaMa'or HaGadol, the big luminary, Lememshel HaTayom, to rule in the day. The Et HaMa'or HaKatan, and the small luminary, Lememshel HaTalayla Ve'et HaTochavim, to rule at night and also the stars. So, right, so here in my class, I'm going to make sure that you understand the textual source for that medrash, right? The medrash says that Hashem first created the sun and the moon the same size, and then the moon complained, and Hashem said, oh, you're going to complain, I'll make you smaller. So the textual <laughs> source of this is the Pasuk says, Hashem created the two big luminaries. And then the Pasuk says, the big one for this and the small one for this. Okay, so you have to see where the source for it in the Pasuk is. Rashi's not coming out, the medrash isn't coming out of thin air. But there's a problem. Is, that, is it two big ones or is it a big one and a small one? So, um, so you know the Medrash that the moon complained and it said you can't have one king with two, uh, two crowns that share, two kings that share one crown. And Hashem said, if so, go and make yourself smaller. So I want to read to you, this is, um, it's on the bottom of the art stool here. It's quoted in the name of Rav Yosef Dov Salavechik. He offers a homiletical insight into the concept of great and small. The greatness of the sun is that it is a source of light, while the moon is small because it can only reflect what it receives from the sun. So not that great and small are about physical size, but that the moon is smaller and that it only reflects the light of the sun. It in itself is not an independent luminary. And he brings a nice um, corollary, in this sense, we pray at a bris milah, 
May this small one become great, for a growing child is the recipient of wisdom and training from parents and teachers. And we pray that this infant will grow up to become an independent source of greatness who will enlighten others. Right, so that's a beautiful connection um, to children. And if you think about it, then what is the moon complaining about? What is it, the moon's complaining, according to this explanation, the moon is saying, why is the sun an independent luminary, meaning it gives off life, whereas I, the moon, am only a reflector, right? What's, what do we want to be? Do we wanna be the luminary or do we wanna be the reflector, right? We all wanna be the luminary. We want to be the source of the light. We want to be the ones who shine. And what the moon is teaching us or what Hashem is teaching us through the moon is there is a value in being a reflector, right? The light, not only does the moon have its power, right? Over tides and in Jewish life over holidays, um, but the moon as a reflector can shine light into places that the sun cannot reach. And one of the lessons then for us is relating to the, the concept of our ego, right? That we as people, Hashem is setting up the world and Hashem is gonna have a lot of rules for us. What does he want us to do? He wants us to obey. He wants us to reflect his light in the world. He wants us to shine his light everywhere where we go in the world. He wants us to be moons. He doesn't want us to be suns. He doesn't want us to be the ones to say, I'm deciding what light to shine. I know how things should be done. He wants us to be moved. He wants us to be the ones to say, Hashem, you just send everything my way and I'll just do whatever you said. You tell me what to keep and I'll keep it. You tell me what to do and I'll do it. You tell me where to be and I'll be there, right? Completely passive in a way, completely lacking of independence or of initiative. He wants us in a way, the moon seems to be telling us the value of being that passive reflector. And this is indeed what Adam Harishon experiences in Gan Eden, right? Fast forwarding a few days, right? Adam in Gan Eden is exactly in that place. He comes to Gan Eden, right? A place of perfection. He is, let's backtrack, the creation of Adam Arishon. What do we know about the creation of Adam Arishon? So the Torah tells us he's created from the earth and then Hashem blew into him that soul. Rashi says the earth that he was created from is not any regular earth though. The earth that he was created from was the earth from under the place of the Mizbeach, under the place of the Beit HaMikdash. Even Adam's physical earthiness is this supercharged spiritual potential physicality. And then we have, obviously, the neshama blown into us, which is our chelak elokamimah, our part of Hashem. The Torah concludes the creation of Adam, saying, Adam Adam now became a nefesh chaya, which Rashi translates as a person, a being that has knowledge and speech. Even though we're physical, but the elevation of Adam is seen in his in his ability to discern, right? His, his ability to, to reflect and understand his knowledge and his ability to speak. We then have the Medrash that says that Adam HaRishon was able to see from one end of the world to the other, right? Probably not physically, literally, but in terms of his wisdom and um, his nobleness, his encompassing of all of the purpose of the world was contained within him. Uh, the Medrash says that when Adam HaRishon died, the light of his heel that shone from his heel was brighter than the sun. Now, again, I don't think it means it literally physically, but the idea that even after the fall of Adam, even after he died, the spiritual brightness that shone from him was greater than the sun, right? We're talking about a giant of a person, um, I once heard um, Rabbi Tatz explains it that um, the way physicality and spirituality were connected in Adam HaRishon was kind of like a, a light bulb that the 
you, know, you need the glass around the light bulb for the light to, to shine. But that glass is like the physicality of Adam Harishon. That, that in Adam Harishon, that glass was so clear, his physicality was so transparent that he was, you, you looked at him and it looked like spirituality. Yes, it had a physical form because he's a physical person, but the spirituality radiated from him so strongly that it was completely the primary side of him. It was so evident that he was a spiritual being clothed in a physical garment. Now he's placed in Gan Eden. Gan Eden is the perfect place, perfect weather. The trees don't need to be tended to. The garden grows by itself. Food is ready for Adam, beautiful fruit trees, good to look at, delicious to eat. And Adam is there. He knows he's not there for the barbecue, right? He knows he's not there just to have the picnic. The trees aren't there for that. What's Adam in Gan Eden for? He's there. The Pasuk says, la'avda u l'shamra. To la'avda means to work it, u l'shamra, and to guard it. But there was no work to be done in Gan Eden. Nothing needed to be tended to. It was, it was all taken care of straight from Hashem. What does he have to work? So the commentaries explain the work of Adam Harishon in Gan Eden was totally a spiritual work. His, he was a completely spiritual being and his mission in Gan Eden was to work on that spirituality, to work on that connection to Hashem and Lashamra to guard it. What do you have to guard it from? Right, to guard it from being harmed, to guard that special connection that he has with Hashem from being damaged. So Adam's in Gan Eden, and the last thing that we read about him before, that's not true, uh, we're told that after he's created, he and Chava were created, they, um, they're they naked, and the Pesach says, they weren't embarrassed. So the concept of being embarrassed is very interesting. We talked about this a lot in class. No, if you don't mind. Um, so what does it mean to be embarrassed? So I'll give you a few examples. So, right, we know it's embarrassing to be naked. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, I'm giving you other examples of embarrassed. You can see what embarrassed means. Embarrassed is when... Um, They set up Kiddush outside and it's sponsored and you notice that there's one special um, delicacy at the Kiddush that really looks amazing. It like reminds you of something you had whenever at some special time and you need to have that. And you kind of like inch your way over there and you stand there while the rabbi makes Kiddush and then like after he finishes, like everybody goes and you, you quickly go and you like grab that and go like this right? Want to make sure nobody else had it. You also want to make sure nobody quite saw that you were so desperate to have it, right? That's because you're embarrassed. Other things of embarrassment are um, when, if you would use your, um, if you would use your eyeliner to sign a check, right? And somebody would say, did you use your eyeliner to sign that check? In this week's parsha, this past week's parsha, Yosef reveals himself to his brothers, and he says they shouldn't be. Rashi says they shouldn't be embarrassed that they sold him down to Egypt. They shouldn't be embarrassed, right? So I said to my husband, "Embarrassed is a strange word." There, Rashi says they shouldn't feel embarrassed. Doesn't mean to be embarrassed. Embar they shouldn't feel badly. They shouldn't feel guilty, maybe, but embarrassed. So. Um, the Sifse Chaim explains that embarrassed, let me read it to you. Embarrassed means when you realize the contrast between what is and what it looks like. When you realize the contrast between what really is and what it looks like. When something betrays its purpose when something betrays its truth. 
So I'm embarrassed when I grab that dessert because when I grab that dessert, I look like an animal. I look like a ravenous animal without any self-control. And it's embarrassing because that's not really me. I'm a human being with a lofty neshama and I do have self-control and I'm not about physical dessert. That's not important to me, right? And when I use an eyeliner to sign my check, it's, it's betraying the higher purpose of an eyeliner has a specific purpose. It has an essence that it's meant for. And when you use it for something as simple as writing on a piece of paper, that's not, that's what is, but it, it betrays what it really is meant to do. And so coming back to Adam and Gan Eden, the reason Adam and Chava weren't embarrassed was because their, the clarity with which they approached the world, their bodies were complete tools of spirituality. There was nothing animalistic about their physicality. It was, it was just the outer rim of that light bulb, their physical bodies. They completely, their physicality was completely loyal to their spirituality. It was completely loyal to their essence. So their physical bodies, yes, they had the ability to engage in intimacy and to produce children, but it wasn't from any place of animalistic desire. It was purely because of the spiritual ability to connect and become one and to produce offspring without any betrayal of that spiritual ideal. It had no component of animalistic desire or physic physical being consumed by physicality. And that was Adam's reality in Gan Eden. This complete physicality was completely seen as a tool for spirituality. It had no independent identity. His physicality and the physicality of the world had no independent identity. It was just an extension, a way to actualize their spirituality in the world, right? And, uh, the world, your, your neshama needs a body in the world. Your neshama can't accomplish anything in this world. You need a body to be able to, to do what Hashem wants of us, to, to live in a physical world and to be close to him, which is what Adam HaRishon was doing living in a physical world and being close to Hashem. Okay, so now what happened? <laughs> How does that, right? You read the psukim in school, we, the girls were just like, I don't understand because we built up this whole thing, this godless of Adam Harisha, this incredible spiritual giant of Adam Harisha. Then you read the psukim and the snake comes along and says, you're not allowed to eat from the trees. And Chava says, yes, we are. We're just not allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge. And the tree says, well, Really, you are allowed to eat from the tree of knowledge. It's just that Hashem doesn't want you to be like him. That's why he doesn't let you eat from the tree of knowledge. And he's eating from the tree. And Chava's like, oh, that looks really good. The snake's probably right. Let's eat from the tree of knowledge. Like, the psukim make no sense. How, like, Chava doesn't even seem to go through any, like, soul searching or, like, nothing. It's just like, oh, okay, that looks good. We, we can eat from the tree. So the Mepharshim explained that what happened with Adam and Chava was that they looked around at Gan Eden. They looked at this incredible world that Hashem had created. They saw the incredible spiritual spirituality of the world. And they saw themselves in the incredible spiritual potential that they had. And they said to God, really all you want us to do is not eat from the Eit Tadat? That's all you want us to do? The world is so clearly spiritual. How could we, how could we eat from the eight Tata? You told us not to. Obviously, the world is a reflection of you, God. Obviously, we can't eat from the eight Tata if you told us not to. That's what you want us to do in the world. But is that really all you want us to do? Just reflect your will? Oh, oh, sorry, hold on a second here. I'm trying to. And they use to plunge themselves into a world of darkness. Because when it's so clear and so evident that the world is a spiritual place with a spiritual purpose, the human feels, I could really do a little more than that. I, I, I have more within me, right? We hear the sun and the moon. I don't just wanna be the perfect reflector. I, I, have some, I have a different idea. Let's make the world a little bit less clearly godly and then when I listen to you, God, and when I fulfill my spiritual purpose, it's going to be such a greater accomplishment. It's going to be such a greater 
Kiddush Hashem. Because to choose spirituality in a spiritual looking world is not such a big deal. But if you make the world look a little, look a little less spiritual, then when you choose godliness, then that really sends a message that Hashem is true, Hashem Echad Ushmo Echad, that the world is godly and Hashem is the only power in the world. And Adam's sin is called in the Gemara an Avera Lishma, a sin for God's sake. His intention was completely pure. His intention was to bring out more godliness in the world. But he wanted to do it with a little bit more of his own initiative. He wanted to have a little bit of a bigger piece in the pie. And the result of eating from the eight tadat. What did the eight tadat do? So, um, where is it? Oh gosh. We read it in the Mechtab, I think. Who says that the, what is the eight tadat tovara? Right. If you think about it, did Adam have a greater knowledge of good and bad before he ate from the sin or after? Was his knowledge of good and bad clearer before the sin or after? Before. before. Sorry. Before, before the sin, he had such clarity of what was right and what was wrong, right? He knew, he knew God was the, the only truth. He knew God was the power of the world. His knowledge of good and bad was so clearly stronger before. It's afterwards that things get confusing, right? All of a sudden after the sin, what happens? Adam, he hides. He hides from Hashem. You hide? You hide from Hashem? And he puts, he gathers things to cover his body. Well, all of a sudden you need to cover your body? Two minutes ago, we said, they weren't embarrassed. Immediately after the sin. And then what happens also after the sin? We didn't get to this in class, so don't tell them. Immediately after the sin, what happens also? He starts to hear God walking in the garden. Walking in the garden? God doesn't walk. God is purely spiritual. All of a sudden, God, everything's become more physical to Adam. He hears God in the physicality much more. Adam becomes rooted in his physicality. He has to cover himself because all of a sudden his body that before was just this luminescent light bulb reflecting the spiritual purpose, all of a sudden the body became rooted in physicality. You looked at the body and all of a sudden it was like, wow, that looks like an animal. We have to cover that or people are going to think that we're animals also. I'm going to think I'm an animal if I walk around showing all this stuff that looks like animals, right? So afterwards things became murky. It was before the sin that they knew good and bad clearly. So again, I can't remember exactly who said this right now, but the idea that the, the Mishnah explains is that what the Eitz Hadat Tov before the sin, it was Tov and it was Ra. And you could tell which was which very clearly. What happened? It was the Eitz Hadat Tov That when they ate from the tree, it became Tov together. Everything became intermingled. Everywhere in the world now, there is no good without bad. There is no, there's no, there's no perfection. There's no clarity of ev everything has good things about it and bad things about it. Reasons I should do it, reasons I shouldn't do it. And that's the chayt of Adam Harishon, is that bringing that mixture, that complete combination of good and bad into each other. So whereas beforehand, he had much more clarity on tov and ra, but after the sin, everything becomes mixed. And if you think about it, that is the punishment of the land. The punishment of the land is that it's going to produce thorns and thistles. What does that mean? Everything that grows from the land is not something you just pick up and eat. Everything has an admixture now. It has, right? If you think about really what grows from the wheat, what the, I think Pasuk is talking about is how many things do you have to go through to eat to make wheat edible? Edible. How many different, right? You go through the malachot of Shabbos. It tells you you have to first separate the outer chaff from the inner thing. And then you have to take the inner thing and it has a husk and you take out the husk. And then you get to the seed and the seed isn't at all edible. You have to crush it down and then you have to cook it. And then you have to, you can't eat raw flour. You have to then, right? There's all these, this beautiful goodness of food in the world now has this huge process even a basic fruit, every fruit has either a peel or a seed, right? I guess the seeds were there to begin with, but the peel, right? 
everything in the world has this mixture of good and bad. This, that's the nature of the world. And so that's going back to the sin of the land and the sin of Adam. The sin of Adam and the sin of the land are completely the same. The idea of the world not reflecting spirituality perfectly, right? When the land produces that tree that produces fruit, the idea is that the world doesn't reflect spirituality perfectly. The world has, physicality has a separateness from Hashem. And in that separateness, the moon has ego. We have ego because there's a separateness from God. We don't perfectly reflect God. If we perfectly reflected God, even Adam Harishon, if he completely perfectly reflected God, he would have had no, no ego. He would have had no ability to sin. His ability to sin comes from the fact that there is a gap. There is ego. And then when we come to the sin, the sin is bringing that ego full, full center. And then the punishment reflects that equally. The punishment is just the reality after Adam does that. The reality is that the world has good and bad mixed together everywhere. There's no, we spend our whole lives trying to separate out the good from the bad, right? In everything we do, in our cooking that we do, right? In our child rearing that we do, in our personal growth that we do, in every decision that we make, we're constantly pulling apart the good from the bad, the good from the bad, trying to separate and get back to that clarity that we, we see as the ideal of being a person that reflects our real essence, of being that that neshama and have that being reflected in our actions and in our who we are, but it's so, so difficult to get back there. So Chazal tell us, this is actually from the Arizal. The Arizal says that we have, Hashem gives us an access point back to the level of Adam before the chait every week. Every week on Shabbos, Hashem gives us, and you know this phrase, me'ein olam haba, a taste of the world to come. The world to come is the place where there is no longer any process. Right? The world to come is the, is the end point. It's the goal. It's the fruit is the tree. That's the world to come. There is no gap between ideal and real. So in a very basic way, right? That's true because on Shabbos we have that confusion or busyness of life dies down, right? We have some time, some space to disconnect and to get in touch with the more essential us, right? Even if it's simply by, you know, you sleep, you don't feel so dragged down by your, your exhaustion, right? You're not running around. Obviously, we're not connected to our technology. We're not busy in the same way. So that's certainly on one level, the idea of just recentering, getting back to who we really are without all those distractions. But I want to show you another level. And it comes from a Rashi. Rashi discusses um, that the Pasuk says that Hashem finished on the seventh day the work that he had done. And Rashi's like, well, he can't really have finished on the seventh day because Hashem didn't do anything on the seventh day. So he really had to finish on the sixth day. So why does it say on the seventh day? So the Medrash goes into an interesting idea that even though it was, or the Rashi, the, the, the opinions in Rashi kind of break on, was Shabbos the end of creation was it the end of the seven days? Or is it a totally separate thing that happens after creation is finished? Is it part of creation? Or is it something that happens after creation is finished? And yeah. 
from the Medrash. Medrash Rava says an analogy. It's like a beautifully decorated chuppah that is set up with the flowers and the canopy and it's waiting and it's missing just one thing. What's the chuppah missing? The kapwa, right? It's waiting for the kawa to come to make use of it. So the mentor says, so too the world was a beautifully decorated chuppah. It's perfect. But the chuppah just being there perfect, it's lacking, even though it in itself is perfect, but it's lacking because it didn't fulfill its purpose. Its purpose is to have a couple get married under it. That's when it really becomes perfect, even though the chuppah on itself is complete, just like the world after six days was complete, but it's like, uh, like you're still waiting for the, right, for the, that cord of resolution. There has to be something that Shabbos is that cord of resolution that draws it to its purpose. It brings it to its completion, even though the, it's done, but it's not fulfilled yet. And the mentor says that that's Shabbos came to the world to bring all those disparate pieces of creation to bring them to their purpose. They describe Kabbalistically, right? The idea of seven is always that six is like, you think of the six sides of a cube. So the world has six uh, sides and then seven is always the center point that unifies those six outer sides. So in the physical world, seven is always unity. And here as well, Shabbos is that day My screen died last night. Oh, there. I don't know if I snooze or what. I just can't see it. <laughs> okay. Um, so Shabbos is that, that thing that gives purpose to the world. What does that mean? The physical world was complete. But until there's the concept of Shabbos, resting, Shabbos mm. is that idea of giving everything its purpose. <clears throat> yes, we have this beautiful, beautiful physical world. We have a complete human. Humanity has begun. But the purpose of it all, when everything just functions independently in the world, it doesn't work towards a purpose. Shabbos is the idea that there is a goal. There is an end point. Shabbos is the concept of end point. That we work, Misha Tarach Be'er Shabbat, Yechav Shabbat. If you worked on Friday, you have what to eat on Shabbos, right? It sounds very simplistic, right? Yeah, obviously, if you cooked on Friday, you have what to eat on Shabbos. If you didn't cook on Friday, you don't have what to eat on Shabbos. But it's much deeper than that because the idea of Shabbos is like Olam Haba, it's the time of ultimate reward, ultimate basking in the glory of Hashem, just living in the moment of end point, living in a time when there is no process, there is no disparity between process and goal. All of a sudden there's clarity, there's a greater sense of spirituality in the world, right? So we're getting back to you, starting to hear the echoes of Adam Arishon before the Chet, that was the world of Adam just living in a time of end point, living in a time when, yes, all you have to do is be with Hashem. That's what Shabbos is. That's what Adam HaRishon was. Adam HaRishon's goal was to just be with Hashem. And that's what we have on Shabbos. We have the ability to just be with Hashem. We know by Shabbos, the, we have the Zachar and Shamar. So Zachar and Shamar, in a way, mirror what Adam was told, la'avda u shamra. What does it mean to Zachar at Yom HaShabbat Lekatsho? So, so much of Zachar is being aware of Shabbos, being aware of what we have. The Gemara says, really, it's a beautiful thing um, that, let me take the medrash. Um, the Hashem said, Matana, Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, I have a special gift in my treasure house. And I want to give it to, to Bnei Israel, And its name is Shabbos. Go and tell them. And it's a beautiful medrash. First of all, speaking of Shabbos as a, as a matana tova, a good gift that Hashem has in his treasure house. It's like his special diamond that he's been saving away, waiting for Bnei Israel to give them. And he says to Moshe Rabbi, you know, I have this gift, Shabbos, that I want to give to Bnei Israel. Go and tell them. And then first I want to know, why do you have to go and tell them? So it's actually the source for a halacha. The halacha is that if you give a child a treat, you have to tell the parents that you gave it to them. When you give a gift, you're supposed to tell the person who it's from. We don't believe in secret Santas or uh, what are the admirers that leave the gift on your 
secret admirer, whatever. Because the whole point of a gift is to build a connection. So if you give a gift without saying who it's from, you lost the potential of the gift. You lost the connecting ability of the gift. So too with Shabbos. Hashem says, go tell the Nisra that I'm giving them Shabbos. Who else is giving them Shabbos? <laughs> Where do you think Shabbos is from? Right? What does it mean, go tell them it's Shabbos? So the Sibne Chaim explains that go tell them it's Shabbos means tell them because if, if you didn't tell them it's a gift from me, they wouldn't have known. What would they think of Shabbos? It's a burden. It's an inconvenience. There's so many restrictions. I can't do anything I like to do, right? I can't even connect to God the way I want to connect to God. I want to play music. I want to write poetry. I want to go on a hike. I want to go visit my relatives who live an hour from here. I want to call somebody, right? I can't, right? All I have to do is sit in my space and be. So Hashem says, tell them it's my matana tova. Tell them it's my special gift. So then we have to think, okay, so what is the special gift of Shabbos? So the special gift of Shabbos is that ability to just sit and be with Hashem. To get back to that place of goal, of end point. And the Torah says, Zachar v'shamar, you have to guard it also. Why do you have to guard it? So all the many halachot that we follow on Shabbos, all of the malachot that we're not allowed to do, they're all part of that, that guarding Shabbos. And that's because when you have that special time of connection with Hashem, it needs to be guarded from interruption. It's like they give the analogy of like a couple in the Yichud room, right after the, the wedding ceremony, right? The couple goes into a room to be secluded for a short amount of time. Right? Can you imagine someone like knocking on the door and saying, I just need to get something from the closet. Can I come in for a minute? Like, what are you talking about? This is, the, this is their special time together, right? This moment of yichud. It needs guarding. In fact, we have guards stand by the door of the yichud room, so they shouldn't get interrupted. That's what Shabbos is. Shabbos is our yichud with Hashem. That special moment of connection, of just being with Hashem. What is it we're not allowed to do on Shabbos? The things that we're not allowed to do on Shabbos, right? Are you allowed to lift something very heavy and carry it across the room? Yeah, that would be a lot of hard work for me. I wouldn't want to do that on Shabbos. But the halacha is, no, you could do that. You could carry the furniture all day and you wouldn't be violating Shabbos. What you can't you do? I can't press the space bar on my computer. I can't flick on the light. That's not hard. That, doesn't, that wouldn't be hard for me. What's the types of things we can't do on Shabbos, right? So you know, so they're acts of creation. They're creating things that show our dominance over the world, our control, our ability to change the world. I can't even pick a blade of grass because that's changing the world from how it was when Hashem started the world, when Hashem, when Shabbos started. Because what I'm not allowed to do on Shabbos is make the focus me. Shabbos is the day where I say, I'm letting go of the world. I'm letting go of my control over the world. I'm letting go of my ego. I'm going back to being a perfect reflector. I'm gonna be the moon. I'm gonna be that being that just accepts God's light and shines it into the world without putting anything of myself, any imprint of my own control, my own creation into the world. And that's how we get back to that level of Adam Harishon, that place of connection with Hashem, but not from a place of weakness, not from a place of, right, not just I'm, I'm the doormat reflecting God's light, but from a place of connecting with that end point and connecting to the goal of finding the purpose in everything and finding that connection to Hashem. Rav Pincus has a beautiful book on Shabbos that some of you may have seen. Um, and he talks about that for many people, Shabbos can be the low point of the week, right? You don't know what to do with yourself. You're, you're bored. You, you don't really know, like, there's nothing to distract you. You're, you don't know how to use your time. And so the, we end up spending, right? We can spend, especially on these short Shabbos, right? You go to bed early, fall asleep, you sleep 12 hours, you wake up, you run to show, you run home, you have lunch, Shabbos, you have a quick nap and Shabbos is over. He talks about the Zahra of Shabbos is about knowing the power that Shabbos has. 
about realizing that Shabbos has not just a day that we can rest and relax, but it has incredible potential to be with Hashem. And if we take that knowledge and use it to use the time on Shabbos to appreciate that time with Hashem, not to, not to just pass the time without thinking, not just to use the time to sleep and read and relax, but to really plug into the connection to Hashem that comes from Shabbos that it gives us. It, it really will make us a different Shabbos. And he talks about using the, the Shamor and Zahor of Shabbos to know, use that Matana Toba to know the power that Shabbos has, to know the ability and to really think about how we can tap into that. What can we do on Shabbos to consciously tap into that, that be with Hashem, that yichud, that yichud room with Hashem. Um, Rabbi Wittenberg was talking over this past Shabbos about having a daily goal in, he was talking about in learning in some, in some uh, Jewish growth. And I thought, you know, at least for Shabbos, we should have a goal that for five minutes on Shabbos, 10 minutes on Shabbos, that we're going to do something uniquely to appreciate our connection to Hashem. It could be focusing on davening more for those 10 minutes. It could be if Tehillim speaks to you, really saying Tehillim. It could be reading um, a book about a Torah personality. It could be reading something on the Parsha. But to really use Shabbos to connect to Hashem and not just to think of it simply as a time to unwind and reboot for the week, which Bar Hashem it does give us, but to really make sure that we're taking advantage of Shabbos to give us that connection to Hashem of that getting back to that level of Adam before the Chit, where we tap into that clarity and closeness that Hashem gives us that taste of on Shabbos. Thank you very much. I hope we are able to uh, build that Shabbos within us. Any questions? Questions, comments? It was, that's the Avera Lishma. It was the wrong thing because Hashem told him not to do it, but he did it because he wanted to bring more closeness to Hashem into the world. But it was still an Avera because Hashem said, that's not how I want you to bring the closeness to me in the world. But it did, so that was, a, it came from his, from the ego, from that I want a bigger say in it. So it's, it's hard because it is an Avera, but it's also with good motivation. Yes. That's connecting to what you're saying, that maybe that was what was supposed to happen. So then the question is, so when God tells us not to, to, to do things, there's like, it's reverse psychology. He tells us don't do it, but really he needs, you see, it's a big philosophical problem you get into like that. You have to, you have to really know what, what you're saying. Thank you for, for mentioning that. I think the way I see it is that Shabbos is about failing better. <clears throat> that we're, we are destined for failure. See the pessimism? <laughs> we are destined to fail. That's the whole story of, of the Torah, right? The whole story of Shemot and Bamidbar is the Jews failure after failure after failure, right? You think Hashem would say, what is this? I'm going to start all over again. It's ridiculous. 
The whole point is we're not able to be perfect. Hashem didn't make us, he didn't want anything to be perfect. It's what we call perfectly imperfect. So we're destined to fail, but Shabbos is about failing better. Getting every week, we should build our perfection more so that we can fail better next week. <laughs> Here's the optimist, you would say it differently. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.